got all the good stuff, which is really nice. So your sign up with Francis paper, does that reference the one? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, because there's so much confusion between that and our Northwestern Hawaiian Islands paper that came out a couple of years ago, I remember the whole thing, oh, we shouldn't do a press release on this because we've already done one on other topics. You know, there's all that stuff. I didn't even reference that in our paper because of Good evening. And welcome to the latest installment in the U.S. Geological Survey Public Lecture Series. I'm Helen Gibbons from the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz, and I have the pleasure of working with tonight's speaker, Kurt Storlazzi. Before I introduce Kurt, I would like to urge you all to come back for next month's lecture on May 31st. The title of that is, Yes, Humans Really Are Causing Earthquakes, How Energy Industry Practices Are Causing Earthquakes in America's Heartland. As a reminder, you can pick up a flyer on the back table. And now to tonight's lecture about the role of U.S. coral reefs in coastal protection, presented by research geologist Kurt Storlazzi. Kurt is currently the chief scientist of the USGS Coral Reef Project. He leads a research team of scientists who examine the geologic and oceanographic processes that affect the sustainability of U.S. coral reefs and reef-lined coasts. Kurt has authored more than 130 scientific papers, reports, and book chapters on these topics. Kurt received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Delaware in 1996 and his PhD from the University of California at Santa Cruz in 2000. He has been a research geologist with the USGS Coastal and Marine Geology Program since 2003, working across the Pacific, Atlantic, Arctic, and Indian Oceans. Kurt is on the steering committee for the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force, and he regularly contributes scientific reviews for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Landscape Change Cooperatives, the USGS Climate Science Centers, and NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary Program. The USGS is pleased to bring you Kurt's presentation on the role of coral reefs in protecting coasts. Please join me in welcoming Kurt Storlazzi. Thanks, Helen. Uh, well, seeing we're going to be talking about a lot of places across the uh, U.S., I first would like to say uh, half a day, Talofa, Aloha, Ola, and uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. So. Um, Today's re presenta or this evening's presentation is going to be about the role of coral reefs in coastal protection. Um, one of the things we, we've done at the USGS and the Hazards Mission Area that uh, the Coastal Marine Geology Program I work under is we're really good at describing kind of hazards and uh, catastrophic events and a lot of times uh, changes to coastal uh, environments, erosion and storm impacts and degradation of um, environments such as marshes and coral reefs. Uh, about a decade, a little more than a decade ago, our, our um, director of the USGS kind of challenged uh, many of us to, okay, well, let's, let's talk about some solutions here. And it really reframed the way a lot of us approach things. And uh, at least for coral reefs, this is hopefully a way that we can better think about coral reefs and protect and preserve them um, as we're required to under US Executive Order 13089, the US Coral Reef Protection Act. So I'm Kurt Strelotzi um, with the Coastal Marine Geology Program. This work's done in conjunction with uh, Mike Beck at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Borja, Eric, and James Shope at the University of California, Santa Cruz. As with most things we do, it takes a team to do these things, and it's a real honor to work with these folks. So where are U.S. coral reefs? Well, U.S. has about t over 22,000 square kilometers of coral reefs, and as you can see from the pie chart, about 70% of them are in the Pacific. In total, the U.S. coral, US coral reefs have been estimated uh, by a NOAA technical report uh, in 2013 to generate just a hair over $2 billion annually. 
Now that's primarily due to tourism, fisheries, um, and uh, ecosystem integrity. So why should we care about coral reefs? Well, most importantly, they're really the rainforests of the sea. If, if anything, they exceed that. They have a higher species diversity than the rainforest. Although they only cover less than half a percent of uh, the ocean seafloor, which remember the oceans are 70% of the earth, they're home to, however, more than 25% of all marine species. Uh, they're a primary source of protein for most island nations. They're also, importantly, they're the nursery habitat for many larger oceanic commercial species. And obviously, for any of you that go to these travel places, obviously tourism's a major source of income for a lot of these small island nations. So recently, we've done some work on corals and coastal protection. Um, here's a plot across the x-axis. Here's incident or incoming wave energy, a uh, plot versus wave energy dissipated. And what this shows is that reefs reduce about 97% of the incoming wave energy. So they actually act like kind of natural breakwaters, protecting coastlines. More recently, the US Department of Defense, uh, we have wrapped up a project, actually we wrapped up the project yesterday, <laughs> for the US Department of Defense looking at the roles of coral reefs on uh, wave-driven flooding of coastlines. And so here on the x-axis, we're talking about reef hydrodynamic roughness. So no roughness is a smooth reef. High hydrodynamic roughness has a lot of live corals. So think about like they stick up and it's like causes a lot of friction. And what we see is if we start over here on the right side with high, good, healthy coral reefs, they dissipate a lot of wave energy and cause lower flooding. But if those coral reefs get degraded, it results in much higher wave-driven flooding. So corals protect coastlines. However, as if they get degraded, they become less effective. You get more coastal flooding. However, I think most of you have seen in the newspapers that coral reefs are at risk. And more than 10% of the world's reefs have already been lost, and another 60% are threatened by anthropogenic activities, mostly land-based sources of pollution. Now, I hate to tell you, but more like 90% are by global impacts, such as temperature-induced bleaching and ocean acidification. And this has been well documented, again, in the news, scientific articles, and elsewhere. Now, I'm going to make a statement here um, that uh, in the US, I, I'd say we've struggled to protect and preserve our coral reefs along populated coasts. And when I say populated coasts, I mean, like, there's the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, over 1,000 kilometers of coral reefs. We really can make those places protected because no one's there. However, they don't provide those, ecos those services to the people who live on the islands. And so in the US, we average uh, on long populated coastlines, less than 1% of the coral reefs are protected. Now, to put that in context, Haiti has 20%. And I'd argue that that's mostly due to economic and geographic reasons. And what I mean by that is first the geographic, like, yeah, let's go make that marine protected area, protect those coral reefs away from here, that are you know, not in my backyard kind of thing. But also for economic and geographic reasons. So say I've got a coral reef right here, but I want to build, and I'm not knocking anyone in the construction industry or anything, but say, say I want to build stru whatever structure that may impact those coral reefs. Well, I'd argue that, well, you know that the fisheries, well, most of the fish are, live over on that reef. and. Um, Oh, the high diversity is over on that reef, and uh, all the tourist boats go on that one over there. So we, if we damage my reef right here, no, no problem. We're going to be OK. <laughs> and in return, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to employ 200 people to build this for two years, and then 50 people to maintain it for the next 30 years. Yeah, just totally making numbers up here. But. And so that's why. And then we, then we they argue, well, but there's ecosystem integrity. and. Well, but you said the tourists don't go here. And so, you know, it's, it usually gets balanced out. You know, if it's a cost, you know, do a cost benefit, well, there's a lot of benefit. And, well, what's the cost? So it seems like it's lost for that way. So if their innate beauty, tourism, fisheries, and species diversity are not compelling enough argument for 
protection and restoration of coral reefs, what is? Well, again, going back to the one thing we in the hazards mission area <laughs> look at a lot is natural catastrophes. Now, this is a plot of natural catastrophe uh, uh, overall losses in green, insured losses in blue. These are adjusted dollars, so it's not just that, oh, well, you know, the dollar's gone up. But these are adjusted losses. And so you see it's starting to rapidly grow, is the, both the number and the cost of these catastrophes. Why is this? More people, we build more stuff, it gets damaged. Not, not anything new here, but it is growing and it's growing faster. So when we think about coral reef areas, well, here shows nice wave, these coral reefs causing these waves to break offshore here off Honolulu and Waikiki, protecting a couple billion dollars worth of infrastructure. Here in Miami, Florida, there's some expensive property right there too. Hagatna, Guam, that's the capital of Guam. Key West, Ponga Ponga is the capital of American Samoa. And so in all these places, the protection of the shoreline is dynamically tied to the health and quality of those offshore coral reefs. Now, not only is it a concern for you know, those of us here, but the Department of Defense also has some pretty expensive gear out there too. And uh, you know, the Department of Defense has over $100 billion worth of infrastructure and low-lying places like this that, again, are protected by coral reefs. So going back to that question, you know, what's a compelling argument? And I'd say dollars and lives. Um, I, uh, one, of our <laughs> one of our people on our executive leadership team said to me a couple years ago, he's like, the only thing that matters in Congress dollars and lives. And so, okay, well, let's try to see if we can quantify the coral reefs in terms of dollars and lives. So my colleague Mike Beck and uh, Jessica Lang uh, did a project for the World Bank Group, basically trying to value coastal protection services for mangroves and reefs. And they did this at a global scale, every 10 kilometers around the world. Incredible project. And so what they did is they measured, they estimated or modeled waves offshore, how they got closer to shore, then how they came over habitats, either over reefs and mangroves, and then they estimated the flooding. So here would be a hypothetical flooding line with the habitat, and then if you remove that habitat, that flooding line is going to be further inland. And then what you do is you quantify the damages between these two, and that's the value of that habitat. Now, to do this at a global scale, and to do this with dis, you know, data from disparate countries, you kind of have to go to the lowest common denominator. It's what you're stuck with to do it consistently. And so they use kind of some 1980s type of technology and models, because that's all they could do at this kind of scale. But they did it, and they showed you know, coral reefs protect you know, over 200 million people around the globe and hundreds of millions of dollars potentially of damage. So, um, well, when you get someone like myself involved, you look, sadly, you make things a lot more complicated. <laughs> and so we basically developed with, in, here in the US where we've got a lot more information, a lot more data, and because like, we did this project on coastal flooding for Department of Defense, we have a lot more complicated tools and give us a lot more resolution and precision. Um, and so we could do it at a much higher level, but it's a heck of a lot more complicated. And so I apologize, but I'm Italian, and so I'm going to show you how we make sausage. <laughs> So just to t explain where we're doing this, we're doing this for all U.S. coral reef line shorelines. So that's the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas and Guam. Uh, let's see, Commonwealth of Northern Marianas is the blue one right over Helen's head. Uh, Guam's the one on the other side of the Hawaiian flag over there. American Samoa, which uh, is not flagged over there. Hawaii's the one that looks like the British flag. Um, 
Then we have Florida, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. These all seem like pretty small areas, right? Little islands. Well, if you actually total it up, it's over 3,000 kilometers of shoreline. Anyone know how long the U.S. part of the West Coast is? 2,000. So it's actually 50% longer, more shoreline than the U.S. West Coast. It's a lot. And if you actually total up the exclusive economic area, the, you know, if you take 200 nautical miles off there of mineral rights, water rights, fishery rights, it's actually more than the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast combined. Okay, so sausage. But this is the cool thing to nerds like me. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get the wave climate off here. So my colleague Borja Reguero did a wave hind cast using uh, atmospheric models to model waves all around the globe every hour for 61 years. That's a lot. It was basically his PhD thesis, but he's a smart kid. Um, and so he did that. However, we can't run 61 years of hourly data, which is half, basically half a million data points at all shore, all those reef line shorelines around the world. It's just way too much. So uh, a wonderfully brilliant lady, Paula Camus at uh, the University of Cantabria in Spain, developed this technique where we can pick kind of, if there's a scatter of data, we pick points in that that best represent it. So we can take that half million data points and turn it into 500 conditions, which is a lot easier to run, <laughs> you know, orders of magnitude less. So then what we do is we run those 500 conditions through this model called SWAN, or simulating waves in the near shore, really standard wave model. So this is showing wave heights, so high wave heights in red, low wave heights in blue. This is the tip of the Florida Keys. So you have big ocean waves as they start to propagate across the reefs, they start to decrease in wave energy, and so you got much lower wave energy close to shore. So that's our step here. And then what we do is we bring it, we extract that data at these transects every 100 meters along the shoreline. So every 100 meters along 3,000 kilometers of shoreline. That's a lot. <laughs> Just doing these SWAN models, we ran 37 SWAN models and that was 98 days of processor time. Thank gosh for numerical modeling clusters. <laughs> um, and thank gosh we didn't do this in the winter time when the power goes off. But so then we set it up on these cross shore transects. And so, oh, so real quick, at the end of those cross shore transects, what we read, we take Melissa's mathematical computations, we regenerate from those 500 conditions that 500,000 hourly data points for 61 years. And then we use that in a model to, to determine return periods. So most of the engineers, they want to know what's the five-year wave height, the 10-year wave height, the 100-year wave height. Um, I don't know why. Most, many of you in here are probably engineers and can explain all that, why you want that. But that gives us those kind of return interval storms. And so then what it allows us to do is to pick, in our case, we were running the 10, 50, 100, and 500-year storms. But we can pick it off. Basically, we model a distribution through the data, some cool math stuff. And so, again, that gets us to our return interval storms. And now it's to model the effects of the reef. So the NOAA's uh, Center for Coastal and Ocean Science undertook in the 2000s an effort to map all U.S. coral reefs at a scale of about an acre. And so they map them. You see a range is here, 0 to 10 percent, 10 to 50 percent coral cover, 50 to 90 percent coral kind of cover, or 90 to 100 percent. So this is Lahaina, uh, Maui. Um, here's the Lahaina Harbor. So this was the original capital of Hawaii uh, when it was uh, run primarily by whalers. And so you see there's a distribution. The reefs sometimes extend further offshore, sometimes have higher coral coverage, sometimes have lower coral coverage, um, and sometimes there's less of them. And so you see, again, here's our transects spaced every 100 meters along the shoreline. So now we have coral coverage along our cross reef transects. So now I'm showing you an example of one of these cross reef transects. So this is from some distance offshore. This is sea level. So here's the shoreline. Um, this line's actually downtown Lahaina's, sits right in here. 
And so it goes offshore, and here's some reef in red. There's some more coral cover here and here, a little bit here and here. So um, the, the top line showing it with the reef. And then what we do is based, um, my colleague Kim Yates and her colleagues in the St. Petersburg office in Florida have shown that because of uh, pollution, because of thermally induced bleaching, that a lot of reefs around the globe have decreased. The corals have died and the reefs have degraded. Now, they showed great variability. Some places it's six or seven feet, some places it's three feet. Because we don't have that data all around, mapped all around the US, what we did is we, we assumed, we just removed in the model a half meter, about a foot and a half of the reef, and took all those live corals and removed them. And so what you're seeing here is the gray is kind of that reef minus the coral versus the reds with the coral. So now we can run the model over the profile with the reef and without the reef. And what that does is we used a model called X-Beach that the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers and Deltaris in uh, the Netherlands and the University of Miami developed to look at storm, like hurricane-induced flooding and erosion along the US sandy shorelines of the eastern Gulf Coast. Works great there. However, if you think about the sandy shores of the East Coast, they're relatively linear, they're relatively gently sloping. Coral reefs are um, pretty much anything but that. And so the model didn't work for this environment. However, uh, working with my colleague Op van Dongeren and Ellen Cartet, uh, Del Taris, uh, during this big DOD project we just finished up, let us do enough experiments to heavily modify the model to be able to work for coral reefs. And so what we're showing here is this is now the flood level right at the shoreline here. So what you're seeing is red is with the reef. So the water levels are about a half meter above normal and kind of hit the shoreline here with the reef. Now when we remove this reef, now the flood levels are even higher and extend further inland. So we can model the effects of the, the reef. And so remember, these are done every 100 meters along the shoreline. So that was a hair over 30,000 models. And that took us over 1,000 days of processor time. Again, thank gosh for numerical modeling clusters. OK, so now we can make flood maps. So here we're showing, this is Key West. This is for a one in 10 year storm. So remember we we're talking different return interval storms. So this is the kind of the average storm you'd see once every 10 years. And so the blue dots are the points where those transects intersect the shoreline. This you know, greeny yellowish, sorry, Lyman. I don't know what you'd call that color. Um, but this is the flood extent. And you see it floods inland uh, and that's with the reef. Now red is without the reef, which is further inland. And so basically everything in this little red zone is the area protected by the coral reefs. And hopefully you can see the resolution of this. We'll zoom in some places elsewhere where we're doing this at every at 10 square meters. So at the scale of your house, around along 3,000 kilometers of shoreline. <laughs> so here shows a one in 10 year storm. Here shows a one in 100 year storm. So the flood lines are Bigger storm, bigger waves, flooding much further inland. And so again, you can see the red, the area between the yellowish, whatever, and the red, this, the red areas are the areas, the effect areas effectively protected by coral reefs. One thing you should note here is that the relative amount, while there's greater flooding here, the relative amount is actually protected by the reefs is less. I'll, I'll show that here again. So. Um, so now that we have what we call these are flood masks, or this is a mask or a coverage of the flood waters, now what we can do is start to say, well, what's in those areas? So the US Census Bureau, every 10 years, does, conducts the US Census. They put it in a database called Tiger. And so you have everything about how many people are there, how many people live in a given household, Po or, you know, if, whether it's poverty, different levels of income, their age, sex, education. So you can parse that out and say, okay, where's, 
how many elderly people are in a location, how many young people are in education, how many low income, minorities, all the information. And so our colleague Nate Wood, who's in Western Geographic here, uh, has developed some really cool tools that lets you basically dig into these incredibly difficult, confusing databases and assimilate that so that we can match our flood mask and that information. So for example here, here is now uh, South Maui. Hopefully you can see here, because I've made them a little bit translucent, now you're looking at individual buildings in this flood masks. So pretty high resolution, kind of like Google Earth, right? For what's the first thing everyone does in Google Earth? Goes looks for their house, right? So now you can go look for your house and see if it's protected by coral reefs or not. Um, but so in this area, the red area again is the area flood protected by coral reefs. And so what we can do is match that up with census data and say, how many people are in those areas? Are they children? Are they elderly? Are they low income? Are they high income? Are they minorities? Are they this, that? All that information's in there. So we can quantify. And that's really good because we understand the impact. Is it disproportionately hitting a certain age group, a certain income group? And we can understand those. Again, that's more of an e uh, ecological kind of thing or anthropologic, but we can do those things. Right now, we're just counting bo bodies. Now, the F Department of Homeland Security and FEMA have a database called HAZIS. And what this does is it has all the information about what those buildings are. are you know, are they essential facilities? Are they power plants? Are they water treatment plants? Are they roads? Are they utilities like power? Uh, high potential loss facilities, hospitals, uh, building specific data. And some of the building specific data is what they have is what we call depth damage curves. So this would be like zero depth and some high depth and zero damage and high damage. So basically with no flooding, nothing gets damaged. But say like, say this line here, maybe this is a wooden house where water gets up to a certain point and it tears the whole thing down. Maybe this is like a concrete structure where the water gets higher and higher and it slowly damages it more. So that we have all this information. So it's not just assuming a building gets wet, it's damaged. It's really how much it has to get wet for that to fail. And that's based on the different building properties. So great data set and we can use our flood masks and their depths in those. So again, here's our same area, our red showing our area protected by corals. And we can all of a sudden go in and say, okay, what's the value of those buildings? So, you know, in these, you know, red, we're talking, you know, millions of dollars of homes and less are here. We can also say how many of those are commercial, how many of those are industrial, how many of those are religious, how much are those government, uh, agricultural. My gosh, there's like, you'd be, a, a, it'd blow your mind how much information there is out there. But in this case, we're just totaling the, the value. And again, why these numbers may be small, some of these may be partial, some of these may be partially damaged or not damaged at all because in some places the flood depths are so low. So like if you're to look at some of these averages, you're like, oh, well, it's only 100,000 per building. When gosh, this is a place with really expensive property. Well, that just means the property's not completely destroyed in some cases. So the thing is, is we know, well, you know, when your business is demolished, it's kind of hard to work. And, uh, when your house is demolished, it's often hard to stay there and go to work. So one of the things we want to say is kind of a follow-on step from this is to look at the impact for the gross, basically the impact of the GDP, people's ability to work. So it's kind of that next follow-on step. And so one of the calculations we can make is the number of people flooded times the average GDP per person per year. Now, this is an older number because the, the Census was only done in 2010. Hazus was done in 2010. So we're using a 2010 GDP number. I think the GDP now is 50, 54,600, but we have to be consistent in our, our data. Then we did the number of commercial industrial buildings, saying that each one of those is a business. And the average, if you go to the Department of Labor, there's average 15 employees per business. So we just take, multiply 48,400 times 15 employees, that gives us just a hair under three quarters of a million dollars per business per year. 
so that we can then go back in here and say, okay, well, the, this is 27 businesses and these are 180 people and thus compute an economic disruption. So quantifying the benefits. Basically, we have these kind of plots. So along the bottom, I'm showing you examples, different return periods. So a 10-year storm, a 100-year storm, which is much bigger, and then a 500-year storm, which is like, my gosh, horrible. And what we're showing you here is, in this example, we're just showing a theoretical population. And so right now, we have a current, or the existing conditions with our reefs, and then the red is with reef loss. So in all of these cases, the difference between these two is about 500 people. So it's about you know, 1,400 to 1,900 in this case. So obviously, the, both of them go up with bigger and bigger storms. However, on this side, we're showing the percentage change. And so that 500 people for roughly, or 400 people for roughly out of 2,000 is actually about, you know, a little over 30% change between this line and this line. However, these lines are much higher, right? So now we're up 500 or 400 out of 3,500. So that's, you know, only about 18%. And so even though there's about the same amount of people protected, because this line's lower here, it's a larger proportion. So what this actually shows is that the effectiveness of reefs and hazard risk reduction is greater in actually more frequent, smaller storms. Now, why that's good is you don't have to say, oh, gosh, well, it's only effective in that 500-year storm, and gosh, we'll never see that. But this is saying the decadal storm, you're getting more effective in what, how long is the average mortgage on a house. You're going to see a couple of those kind of storms. So it's not just, oh, this is something we don't have to worry about. And they're really effective at useful timescales on the timescales that we make financial decisions. So now I'm going to show you some actual some data and some of our calculations. So the, both these plots are shown, pardon me, <coughs> the number of buildings for a bunch of storms. So again, the 10-year, the 50-year, the 100-year, and the 500-year storms. The red is uh, with reefs. The blue is without reefs. So it's hot. basically when we remove the reefs, more buildings are getting, would get damaged. I'm showing you three sets of numbers here. AED is the annual expected damage or the expected value of losses per year with the reef. Would be, in this example, 169 buildings per, or 169 buildings per year. The, annual, the AED without reefs is 731. And then if we do the annual expected benefit or the expected value of avoided losses per year, it's 500, basically 562 buildings per year that coral reefs protect on the island of Maui. Here on Guam, where there's less development at the coastline, it's mostly up on the high limestone plateau, lower numbers, same kind of trends, increases with increasing storms, without reefs is higher, but our annual expected benefit is now just 19 buildings. We go to looking at the resulting damages. So remember the damage is a function of not only is it flooded, but how deep it's flooded and what the quantum building it is. We see that the annual expected benefit is about $63 million per year for, uh, for Maui, and Guam, with the fewer buildings, is just only $4.3 million per year. But that's per year. So you think over the lifespan of an average building or a mortgage, that's up. And then if we do the number of people, again, we have the same numbers with reef, without reef, and the annual expected benefit. It's about, in Maui, it's 1,845 people per year. It's a pretty big, high number. And then the Guam, again, with fewer people by the coastline, it's only about 60, just here on over 63 people per year. <coughs> okay, so let's pull all that together. So if we look at the damage in millions and the number of people for Guam, we have 60, basically $63 million a year in damage and 100, uh, 1,845. But if we take that 1,845 people times that annual contribution to GDP per year, that's 
89 million per year. We add that to the property damage, that totals about $152 million in total avoided damages and economic disruption per year. It's a good number. And to put that number in context, the value of, for the, all the eight islands in the state of Hawaii for recreation, tourism, and fisheries, for all of them combined is $426 million a year. So that 152, just the damage risk reduction, the hazard risk reduction is a third of that for one island. And remember, Oahu's got 90% of the people and probably 90% of the infrastructure. So basically, we're going to more than double the value of coral reefs if we include coastal protection. And so let's think about some of the other things we can do with these tools. So we're modeling flooding along the coast. And so I'm just showing you our same kind of return period, showing you current reefs, future reefs, and what, whichever our metric is here. But say let's talk about coral reef degradation, like climate change, land use practices, sea level rise. Well, that's gonna push that number up. And now again, we can, so if we degrade the reef more, add sea level and that flooding's further inland, we can again use these same data sets to quantify the dollars and lives to say what's that value. The other thing that's really neat is we can do the reverse of that, is we can say here's a degraded reef. If we increase the health of it, that flood is going to be less, that the flood is going to be less far inland, and now we can, we can count up between the before restoration and the post restoration, and that's the, the benefit of that restoration. And this is becoming really exciting. And again, so that would drag those values down. And so now that area between the two is the benefit of that restoration. So the question is, is how does the US decide to fund post disaster restoration? Anyone? Because I had zero clue about this myself. Okay. So it's FEMA's BCA toolkit, or benefit cost analysis. Good way to do thing, right? You know, value, balance, and benefit and cost. And so it's, in this case, you could do the risk reduction versus the cost. And the cost in this case would be coral reef restoration is about half a million dollars to $3 million per kilometer shoreline. Sounds like a lot of money, right? Does anyone know what a cost of offshore breakwaters are? Oh, it's an order of magnitude higher than that. I'll just, I'll, sorry, I'll save you the suspense. But yes, it's or, an order of magnitude higher than that. So what you really want is a benefit cost analysis greater than one. Really good projects are like five to one or 10 to one, but you need to be able to quantify both sides of that. Well, we, we already know the cost of restoration well, now we can do risk reduction. However, the U.S. Office of Management and Budget Circulate ACE 94 and the U.S. Stafford Act says this has to be done at a spatial resolution, at economically rigorous manner, to certain degrees. Well, we're sure doing it at a spatial resolution. And, well, FEMA just determined we meet those needs. So this model framework we've developed is rigorous enough financially, rigorous or spatially fine enough to really meet those needs. And so what that says is, you know, all these tools that they use to, to, to fund gray infrastructure, seawalls, breakwaters and stuff, we can be used it to fund green infrastructure. And like I said in the previous slide, green infrastructure is an order of magnitude less costly. And provides those other things like tourism, fisheries. And so uh, Lloyd's of London, folks have probably heard of them, big insurance people, they actually put together a tool, uh, uh, a document kind of saying, okay, well, what are the different things? And you can do pre-disaster funding, you know, things like with the Corps of Engineers, FEMA pre-disaster mitigation grants, uh, post-disaster funding, these flood mitigation assistance programs, something that's happening right now in the Caribbean. 
following the hurricanes. <clears throat> and they also break out like who pays versus you know, who benefits from this. Well, again, so now these are all funds that theoretically can be tapped into. And we can do two. How do you restore a reef? Well, there's two things. One, you can do structural. These are basically concrete balls called reef balls that can be dumped out on the seafloor to increase the water depth. And then new corals uh, land, recruit to them, and grow through time. And they've got all these nice holes in them, so fish like to hide in them, and they're really good. But they cost something, right? The other thing is uh, NOAA's uh, uh, Coral Reef Restoration Center and a lot of governments in the Caribbean, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, uh, foreign governments, actually have their own coral nurseries. So you can not only put the structural feature out, and we can model that structural feature by the decrease in water depth, but we can also measure the increased roughness of those corals. So we can quantify the hazard risk reduction and the resulting costs in dollars and lot or savings in dollars and lives of both the structural restoration and the biological restoration. And then do those benefit cost analysis for both of those. This is all great in theory, but um, sadly, the uh, Hurricane Irma and Maria tore through the Caribbean, uh, causing billions and billions of dollars of damage. Well, we had already set the model up for these areas, for you know the coral reefs, uh, the reduce the annual damage, and the people flooded. And again, so we could flip this model around, and so we could take the, well, in this case, it would be the existing reef, put the restored reef on top of it, and have that reduced. So to basically guide where can they do restoration to reduce coastal hazards. And we now have a proposal in to do this with Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands to basically guide restoration to reduce coastal hazards. So we can improve the health of the ecosystem, increase fisheries, increase tourism, and do it to reduce coastal hazards and in an economically beneficial way. So where can this lead us? Now this is exciting stuff and you people are probably an order of magnitude more financially savvy than I am. But Mike Beck and the Nature Conservancy is really trying to say what's the next step in this. Is where we talked about how there's these mechanisms to fund it. Well the first one's insurance. And what one can do is fund restoration of damaged reefs using insurance. You could set the rates to promote protection. And this is something that the Nature Conservancy is working with Swiss RE. Now, if you don't know Swiss RE, Swiss REs, they're the insurers of the insurance agencies. So they're in the billions of trillions of dollars. Like, and uh, so when you start to get those folks on board, all the little state farms and stuff like that kind of will follow. The other is, another example is resilience infrastructure bonds. And so they can pr support pre-reef restoration based on this protective hazard risk reduction benefits. They can also pay for defense through the reduced cost of insurance bonds. And this is something they're doing with Munich RE. <coughs> now, I believe Munich RE is so big that they insure Mexico, <laughs> Caribbean coast. So again, large scale. So really what they're doing and this, again, is the Nature Conservancy in Munich RE and Swiss RE is really a resilience insurance solution that overcomes the trade-offs between risk reduction and risk transfer. So you know, this upfront reef restoration investment reduces risk. This risk mitigating impact reduces premiums. And that's an incentive is created for restoration and risk transfer. So here shows current coastal funding for conservation and infrastructure over the first 15 years of the century. So this is dollars spent, that's billions. You see what goes into biodiversity aid like coral reef restoration and things like that. You go over to the other side of here, and sure losses is over a quarter of a trillion dollars. So using these mechanisms with 
insurance, well, the reinsurance industries, the insurance industries, infrastructure bonds. What we're looking to do is see if, if somehow we could get a little of that money coming out of the insured losses, put it into biodiversity aid to reduce that overall large damage. So the implications, well, again, there's private incentives such as insurance and resilience bonds. Public incentives are these pre-disaster green bonds and special purpose tax districts, post-disaster FEMA restoration funds. But the big thing is, is prioritization of natural infrastructure and policy. FEMA is starting to buy in on this. Hopefully next we can get the core because we're doing it to save dollars and lives. So in summary, coral reefs are a first line of defense. We can accurately and rigorously account for the defenses the reefs provide. We can generate value-based information to guide restoration and increase efforts to increase the resilience of coastal communities and ecosystems at management relevant scales. And that's really important. And so, you know, the push now, not by us at the USGS, but our colleagues is to get the nature included in these in industry risk models. Because people aren't going to make the right decision when the industry, insurance industry says we're not going to insure that, not going to build it. And that's where I think we'll start to get to really smart growth. So we're trying to link coral reef ecosystem health to coastal hazard risk reduction. And that's to reduce risk, increase coastal resilience, and better direct reef restoration efforts. That's all. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you, Kurt. So now it's time for questions. And as usual, we'll ask you to go to the um, two microphones that are already set up. Or if you'd like, I can bring you this handheld mic. So is there any breeding of higher temperature resilient coral? Yes, there is. Um, I cannot remember, it wasn't the government that funded it, and I don't want to say it's like Elon Musk, or it was, it was a private group that funded it, and it's the, what they call the Coral X Prize. And what they're doing is they're, doing, they're basically going out and trying to find corals that live in really extreme high temperature environments. Uh, places on the island of Ofu of American Samoa go up to like 35 degrees C every day, places in the Arabian, Arabian Gulf and saying, gosh, these ones are <coughs> predisposed to be able to handle those high temperatures and trying to breed those. Now, obviously, when you start breeding select groups, you decrease biologic diversity, you make potentially susceptibility to disease and things like that. But they're doing that. They're doing it, and I can't remember where in Australia, but they're doing it at the University of Hawaii's Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology on Coconut Island off Oahu. So that's Ruth Gates and others are basically trying to breed super corals. Yes? Um, you were talking about um, uh, the restoration of reefs. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a point of no return where uh, a reef, co collection of reefs can no longer be restored? And as a follow-up to that, are we at that stage for the Great Barrier Reef? Um, okay, so the first question, can reefs hit a point of no return? Yes. Uh, we've seen certain places in Hawaii where there was really poor agricultural practices, primarily sugar and pineapple, where so much sediment ran off the islands for 100 years that the reefs died and they created so much sand that there was no more hard ground. Corals need to settle on hard ground to grow. They can't land on sand. And so what we call is a phase shift, like it's shifted to sand and it's not going to be reef again. So that can happen. Has the Great Barrier Reef hit that point? <clears throat> There's a lot of biologists and ecologists would, that would argue that. I'm a geologist and I've looked, well, I've, I've had colleagues and others that look at history and say corals have been around for a quarter of a billion years. They've gone through some pretty bad things. They're going through bad things at a lot higher rate, but there's going to be some refugia in some places where they're going to make it through. Are the reefs going to look like they look like today? Probably not. Um, and we're going to lose a lot of those ecosystem services along the way. 
but do I think corals as a, oh gosh, I don't know if it's a gen, it's not a species, it's a genera or somewhere in that phylum kingdom thing. I'm sorry, I'm a geologist. <laughs> um, you know, we're not, they're not going to go extinct. Some species may. I will say this is one of the big problems with restoration historically is they've, they've in those coral reef nurseries, they've grown really fast growing corals. Because, man, it makes you feel good when something grows fast, right? Like in your greenhouse. <laughs> However, the corals that grow really fast, they pour everything into growing fast, and they're really, really not robust and resilient. I mean, not really, but like these are the kind of things you sneeze on them and they die. And what they've really done is they're looking to shift the corals, and this has only happened the past couple of years, because we're like, I hate to say some of the geologists came in and be like, that species is, you know, you look through the geologic record and like anytime there's a slight change in the climate, man, those things go, they go, they go. And sadly, some of the main coral species that the U.S. has put on the threatened and endangered species list are those corals. Acropora. Acropora is this general, they look beautiful, they're out there. But man, the geologic record, something happens, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone. And they want to breed those because they make you feel good and they're in a threatened and endangered species. However, they're not really robust. The slower growing ones are the hardy ones. And so at least in a lot of these nurseries, they are moving towards those more robust species. And I mean, obviously you want, you want a diverse group to keep biodiversity up, but they're realizing that, gosh, you know. The other problem is in a lot of places, like, hey, when there's a vessel grounding or a hurricane, like Irma came by and destroyed acres and acres of reefs in the Keys. Okay, you can put corals back there, but in a lot of these areas where it's <clears throat> wastewater discharge that's killed the reefs or land-based pollution that's killed the reefs, are you gonna take a new canary and put it back in the same coal mine that killed the last canary? And sadly, that's what's happened in a lot of cases. And so they're trying to be a little smarter about, okay, well, you know, a vessel grounding site's a great place to replant corals. But in a lot of these places, they're being stressed by other factors, and us putting coral replants or transplants in there is just going to have them die. So we need to better manage those things. The nice thing, well, I shouldn't say the nice thing, but the thing about land-based sources of pollution, these can be solved locally at a jurisdiction level, at a state level, at a territory level. And we can hopefully reduce those stressors to hopefully make those corals a little more resilient because the global stressors are the ones that we can't stop in Hawaii, in USVI, in Puerto Rico. The increased temperatures that can cause bleaching and the increased ocean acidification. But at least if we can reduce land-based pollution, we can remove that one stressor. Oh, sorry, he's leaving. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thanks. So. I have a couple of questions. One is uh, like you did all these calculations. Uh, did you test against the real data? Oh yes, because um, I always say I can make a model that shows purple elephants fly, <laughs> but uh, that's one of the things we're good at, and we're I mean I should I would say we're forced to, but that's one thing we do is we have to prove our models work, and so we've run these the flooding models in certain locations to see that they're doing accurately. Because if you can't model the present and do it right with data to do any projections, I mean, then you're out of your mind. Sadly, it happens. I will say here at the US, just though, we have to go undergo peer review. So we have our colleagues look at it and they'll call horse duty. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is that you didn't show it. You showed the predictions, but not how did it test again the real data, and I was looking for it. Okay, well, <laughs> I've got, trust me, I've got a bazillion. No, I'm not saying, I'm not questioning, I'm just saying. I, I, just, think, saying I just didn't think that was gonna be the most exciting thing to show you folks. Oh, okay. There's a lot more even, I mean, that was enough sausage, I thought, for most people, <laughs> and I was kind of trying to limit what I was showing you. But yes, it has been calibrated and validated, and it's actually been peer-reviewed and published, this methodology. And the, so. another question I have is that the restoration, mm -hmm. uh, do you, are you assuming that all the coral reefs have been damaged or it's just specific areas which may require restorations? And then also, as you mentioned about these local 
policies and practices versus the global practices which are impacting the coral reefs. I'm not going to remember the, that's a real long discussion. Can I go the one at a time? You were asking about the coral reef. I apologize, I'm short attention span. I'll get lost there. Um, so the first was asking about restoration. Well, what we know is already in some places that there are, I mean, this is zero to 10% live coral coverage. So as of right now, maybe we could restore these and bring them up to 40% live coral cover. However, when you're asking in other places, like in Florida, Puerto Rico, USVI, the uh, NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program went out and did 300, 400 some sites visits and noted the degree of coral damage so that we know, and they've recorded that, so we know that, okay, there was 30% live coral and now it's down to 5%. So we have data on that to say, so then what we can do is say, okay, we're gonna take, say this is a map, this is the a map after the damage. Okay, this is all now 5% live coral coverage. Let's make it 50% live coral cover and run the model on it. So that's how we're doing that part. Sorry, please, now you No, so the, my next question was that, how you're going to reduce the local practices to, so when the restoration is done, that the restoration stays there and not degrade again? Well, again, some of the places it's been, right now the only place we're doing restoration, we're trying to model to guide restoration, is in those areas impacted by hurricane damage. So those were, in some, most cases, he relatively healthy reefs not impacted by land-based pollution. Some of those are though, and that's a very important question is, okay, well, this is a degraded reef, this was a oh, storm impacted reef, but it was already degraded. So, well, first off the USGS, let me stress, does no policy. We provide science to make other people make decisions or make better informed decisions. So them knowing that, hey, it's that water quality is already violating the Clean Water Act or something, that's something that EPA or someone else needs to step in and say. So we can't guarantee it, we don't do the restoration, we don't make the decisions to do the restoration, we provide the science so that they can make a better informed decision. But they're gonna be, know, have that knowledge of, okay, this area is not impacted by land-based pollution, got trashed by a hurricane, if we restore it, here's our benefits. We can say, hey, we can restore this one and this would be your benefits, but you might have less successful restoration, or at least the biological or ecological restoration. We still put those big reef balls out and help reduce the wave energy. But so there's a lot of information and not all that information comes from us. And there's a lot of local management decisions that need to be made. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. My pleasure. Okay, well, maybe okay. that's Thank it. you very much for coming, folks. We really appreciate it.